Good God, I talk too much. So yeah, another year, another top 10 video. Now I know top 10 games of 2017 shouldn't really need that much of a preamble, the title's pretty self-explanatory, but I need to make a clarifying statement before we begin. As with every year I've done this, this is not to be taken as a definitive statement on the best games of the year. For a start, it's all subjective opinion, but more importantly, I can only play so many new releases a year, and everything is coming from my own bank account. No review copies here on RSG. I set myself a target every year to play at least 10 games, and I'm happy to say I surpassed that this year, giving me some room to play with my top 10 picks. But even so, this is really just an ordering of the games I've played this year, least to most favourite, and I want to make that clear. Because no, No Man's Sky wasn't the 10th best game of 2016, it was my least favourite of the 10 games I played that year. And I only played 9 games in 2016, that's how disappointing it was! But with that cleared up, my top 10 games of 2017. Speaking of disappointments at the number 10 slot, this first game is one that's hard for me to process. A game which by its very genetics should have been top tier, yet at the same time is no real surprise it turned out a disappointment. Mass Effect Andromeda. God, it still hurts to say that. So, for those who aren't aware, a quick summary of my feelings on the Mass Effect series. Yeah, I'm a fan. Indeed, taken as a singular work, the original trilogy, which I guess we're calling it now, sits within my top two or three games of all time. So you can guess my excitement and concern at the announcement of a new entry into the franchise. Sure, the Shepard trilogy didn't really end on the best of footings, but additions like the Extraordinary Citadel DLC showed that Bioware still had it. But enough beating around the psychotropic space bush, how was Andromeda? Next. Set 600 years after Mass Effect 3, a colonisation effort by the Milky Way races arrives in the Andromeda galaxy, having left around the time of Mass Effect 2, thus being spared the events of the third game. This setting provides newcomers to the series with a fresh plate and minimal baggage, and for the devs, it provides the same. But while this plot is an interesting concept and it makes sense as a new game, unfortunately, it's boring. I don't normally do spoilers in these, but if you hadn't noticed, I'm slightly invested in this series. So, right at the start of the game, day one in Andromeda, you encounter a hostile alien race hell-bent on controlling remnant technology, left by some long-gone alien civilization. Intriguing, mysterious, I wonder where the plot will go. By the end of the game, we've learned a grand total of three things. The generic evil alien empire we thought were bad guys all along, were actually a generic evil alien empire. The ancient alien civilization that's so mysterious was actually all along just some unknown ancient alien civilization. And thirdly, the Krogan is the best companion. We're gonna destroy everything you care about. There's only one thing getting destroyed here today, and that's you, and this place, and also your boss, and probably your entire crew. So a lot of things are getting destroyed here, actually, and all of them are yours. I don't really have much else to say about the main plot because that's pretty much it. Oh, and there's a new alien species, and they're ugly. So, this ain't Mass Effect 1, where the plot and settings will keep you going. The only twist in this damn game, unless you count the oh no reveal about the ugly new aliens, which really who gives a shit, it's not like they're fucking GEATH or anything, comes from following one of the most tedious side quests, where you collect your dad's memory fragments, which are for some reason scattered across random planets, which he never visited. What? But if you want some kind of connection to the previous games and a reason to care for this frankly awful colonisation effort full of just the worst people, then this is the closest to giving a damn you'll find, in a deceptively mundane quest, which ironically was actually one of my favourites for what it revealed. What about 2, with its emphasis on the characters and the interpersonal relationships with your squad? Here I will give the game some props. While I ain't counting any of this crew among my top companions of the series, they're all around good considering they had one game, what the trilogy had, well a trilogy. The eccentric Asari adventurer PB and the grizzled old Krogan Drac were probably my favourites. Incoming! Though it was cool to finally have a Fem Garrus and the non-combat crew were all pretty likeable. As always though, it's the humans who fail to appeal. Seriously, whatever your name is, James 2, learn about personal space, just stop touching me at every fucking opportunity. to stop. stop. STOP! Companion quests are a thing here, but while every one in Mass Effect 2 was like 
the good episode that season of some badass sci-fi TV show, each one memorable and significant to the companion's individual character arc, and Dromedas are just side quests. Some good side quests, like Drax, who once again, best person on that ship, but just nothing special overall. So, what about gameplay? Exploration is a strong suit. I actually like the space travel in this, especially with that bridge view. When on solid ground, the maps are large, visually pretty, and your ride actually almost obeys the laws of physics. No offence, Mako, I still love you. The settlement building component of the game, though, which really is at the forefront of everything you do as essentially main plot B, just feels uneventful. Once again, I don't really care if you terrible people get a new flat pack home or not. You suck. You didn't even invite the Elcor, you bastards! Combat is solid enough, with the addition of jetpacks opening up platforming and other stuff we didn't really need before, but thanks. But as one hand giveth, the other hand removes meaningful squad commands. I do not like. Abilities were a major part of the combat in the trilogy. Here, sure abilities exist, but the system feels bare bones, with tactics amounting to point and shoot at the thing, using the same two abilities again and again, all the while your squad mates just do their own thing. And sometimes a bit literally. Yeah, and that takes us to the last major thing. The bugs. This is a buggy game. Granted, most of it's superficial, but it did have at least one game breaker. So, earlier that day, I finished up a main quest in Generic Evil Alien Base. A couple hours down the line, on a totally different quest, I was on the other side of the goddamn planet activating one of these remnant bunkers, little dungeons which upon completion contribute to the planet's habitability rating for settlements. Fun shit. So, I activate the bunker, it begins to purge as normal, but after an accidental fall down a pit... Now I'm back where the alien base quest took place. How? The bunker music's still playing, the red lighting's still there, my objective hasn't changed, I've just somehow fallen through space and landed in a totally different mission. I... Don't know. Reload. Character animations, particularly in the face, are another problem. Now, I'd shake this off as no big deal, but the dead-eyed and weird inconsistent facial animations are just really off-putting, and I don't know how they got it so wrong. I mean, for fuck's sake, 2012, Commander Shepard watches in horror the invasion of Earth to which she's powerless to prevent, but vowing to return and avenge all those lost. God, it's powerful right in the feels. 2017, My father's dead. Alec is dead. Strangely for me, I didn't even bother customising my rider. I just couldn't do anything to make her not look like garbage. Why the hell does Dragon Age Inquisition, a 2014 Bioware game, have one of the most powerful facial sculpting systems I've seen, and Andromeda have this? Well, I didn't want this review to be overly negative, but fuck, I can't help it. Mass Effect Andromeda is, past all this shit, an alright game. It has good, even great stuff. The exploration, the combat system, some of the character moments. The Bioware skeleton it's built on is a good one. Just please, build something stronger on top of it next time. I don't know if it's EA, Bioware itself or what, but with a new IP on the horizon in 2018, just please, Bioware, to quote my co-host, get a rock and crush you under it and under pressure, become the diamond we invested in. I, uh, I don't know what the fuck he's saying half the time. Yeah. It wouldn't be an end of year top ten list without me getting sick at some point. Don't worry, it's only for this one. I'd been pretty split on my number nine pick. For most of the year, actually, while I hadn't quite played enough games for a complete list, I was considering including a tiny little indie piece of stupid fun that barely even qualifies to be called a game. Ultimate Epic Battle Simulator. Come on, look at it, you can throw the Romans against like 25,000 penguins. Unfortunately above that, there was little else to actually talk about from a gameplay perspective. Then I found something else. 
a particular game I was aware of, but actively ignoring since due to its episodic nature, I was under the impression it wouldn't be complete till 2018. Turns out I was wrong, however, when the third and final episode of this other, barely even qualifies to be called a game, dropped in December. Life is strange, before the storm. My feelings going into this were mixed. On the one hand, I'd played and loved the original Life is Strange back in 2015. Actually ended up being pretty high on my top 10 list that year. However, I'm also very aware of the problems with that game looking back. I couldn't help wonder if this was just a rehash, a less special the second time returned to form without changing much. And yeah, that pretty much was how it turned out. Gameplay mechanics had been stripped down, if anything. Visuals, as far as I could tell, were unchanged, story scope reduced, and length cut from five episodes to three. But god damn it, did it still get me anyway. Before the Storm acts as a prequel to the original series, centered around the home and school life of Chloe, the non player secondary protagonist of the first game, and in particular focuses on her referenced but never witnessed friendship with Rachel Amber. In essence, it's kind of a point-and-click adventure type game, along the lines of a lot of Telltale titles, with dialogue puzzles, item hunts, puzzle games, and once again, a buttload of difficult choices. Interestingly, you can actually experience a microcosm of the entire game in the first episode, when you- holy shit, you guys playing D&D? Count me in! I am Elema, wizard of the Third Circle and sworn defender of Avernus. I once stabbed a guy in the chest with a sword, and it went all the way through and killed the guy behind him, too. True story. Only a small, elderly dragonkin is keeping watch. He notices you, and in terror, runs into one of the few empty cages and locks himself in. Intimidate. That's a skill I have. Can I do that? I want the little bastard to shit his pants. I'm so happy this was a thing. When you're asked if you want to join in, honestly, I'd be just expecting a fade to black, fade back in, thanks for playing, that was fun. I didn't expect an actual minigame, complete with branching choices, speech checks, and punching a minotaur in the dick. I want to punch that stupid man-cow in the dick. Like, right in the dick? Right in the dick. But what this segment does is actually demonstrates a lot of the sort of challenges you'll come across through the entire game. From the various speech challenges used against characters, to making choices and considering how they'll affect other people. For the record, I sacrificed myself to save Elamon. I mean, I kinda did accidentally sever his feet off at the ankles, so it seems fair. The game itself does honestly play out most of the time as a teen drama, with all the insufferable bullshit you could imagine, where literally everyone in this town are just terrible people. Except maybe Mrs. Price. She's... she's lovely. I, f I just feel perpetually bad for all the shit she goes through. REPLY TO YOUR MOTHER FOR FUCK'S SAKE CHLOE, SHE'S WORRIED ABOUT YOU! While I was playing the game, I was thinking something. While I could at least tell you the plot of the original series, complete with all its crazy sci-fi time-travelling elements, along with the layers upon layers of gut-wrenching drama bullshit, ranging from, oh my god the people in this town are assholes and I wish I could kill them all, to, oh my god this town is actually beyond saving, maybe I should kill them all. Shit gets dark in that game. Here, I don't think I could actually describe the plot, at least not succinctly, because it's just... not really one. Things just happen. Did I get an emotional reaction out of these things, though? That I did, and that's why I can say it worked. Even though the story feels more reined in than the last installment, actually dropping the time travel component entirely, Before the Storm gets by on character alone, Assuming you actually give a shit about them. Which brings me to a pretty big question mark. Do I recommend this game to people who haven't played the original? On the one hand, a lot of suspense is removed with this being a prequel. I already know who lives and who unfortunately dies. This makes me less concerned about my own or anyone else's well-being if I fuck up a decision. But, on the other hand, knowing what comes in the future makes the story of these characters and the story of their friendship and the major theme of wanting to escape all the more painfully tragic. If someone plays this fresh without the background of the original, sure they won't know what's coming, but will they give a fuck? Honestly, it's a question I don't have an answer to yet, but I err on the side of just doing it the way I did, playing the original first. Before the Storm wasn't something I was particularly eager to see. It wasn't a part of the backstory I felt I needed to know, never mind base an entire new experience in. But, despite my misgivings and despite how low-key the story is in an already remarkably low-key setting, I can say I'm really glad that I did get around to it. 
It's a prequel which by no means takes away from the original, and does add some real charm and depth to a part of the story often referenced before, but until now, never actually seen. In the end, I was glad to have the chance. Number 8 Destiny 2 I just want to begin by saying I know the response to this game has been pretty polarising. I don't typically read or watch reviews before I buy games, preferring to have a blank slate from the get-go, but given my extreme love-hate affair with the original, Destiny 2 had to be the exception here. Since finishing the game though, I've watched hours worth of specifically negative content, almost to try and ground myself in a realistic frame of mind for this game, to make sure I'm not getting carried away by, oh look at the pretty loot! At the end of the day, it has faults. Faults actually doesn't cut it, it has fuck ups. Big, glaring fuck ups, and I fully recognise what those are. Regardless though, I personally, plain and simply, liked it. Would I feel comfortable recommending others to go out and spend their money on it though? Hmm. Destiny, set in a future where humanity's golden age of space travel has long since passed, following the collapse, triggered by an ancient conflict between the Traveller and its old enemy, the Darkness. But in the centuries since, the dormant Traveller uses its mysterious power, known as the Light, to imbue guardians such as yourself with incredible powers, including immortality, and such guardians protect and defend the last city of Earth and the Traveller it's built beneath from the forces of darkness. And I'm real glad I can tell you all this backstory, because two years ago, even after completing the bastard first game, I knew none of this. Destiny 1's narrative storytelling is already infamous. Maybe because the lack of a narrative or any kind of storytelling. While it had plenty other issues, from a shitty RNG system to awkward level progression mechanic, this alone was the real killer for me. But for Destiny 2, all we really need to know going in is, you're a badass and everyone loves you. The game opens with The Last City under attack by The Cabal, a Warhammer cosplaying alien empire from the first game competing with the Vex as the least interesting enemy faction. The source of power to the Guardians is severed, and you're left for dead before going on a journey to build a resistance, reunite the Guardian leadership, and launch a counter-attack to retake the city. So, there is a story this time. You have an actual antagonist, with a name, and a face, and a backstory, and a motivation. Yeah, he's by no means spectacular, but he works fine. You have actual characters now. Hawthorne, Zavala, Ikora, Cade Six, Failsafe, Holiday, The Consul. None of them are again spectacular, but they're fine. There are stakes now, from losing the city, to losing your powers, to finding out they can blow up the sun if we fight back. But again, it's fine. Except for the part where you get your powers back a mission later, that really kinda sucked. But you know, game. I'd kinda justify its placement on the list, even if for admittedly not being a particularly fantastic game, but just in the same way I spent Mass Effect Andromeda, a game coming off the back of one of my favourite franchises, waiting for it to become good, I spent all of Destiny 2, a game coming from a place of absolute meh, waiting for it to piss me off, but it never really did. Yeah, the characters aren't particularly deeply explored, existing only to crack jokes, further the plot, or exposit a little. But again, I can't get angry that they aren't all fleshed out and multifaceted. They're typical game characters. Cade 6 is funny, we get it, everyone likes Cade 6. Zavala is a leader, there's nothing more we really need to know about him and he works fine for me. Ikora is the one I barely even noticed in the original, but here she actually works better than most. Then there's Failsafe. But the Vex are alien robot monsters. Standard moral parameters do not apply. It's not murder if it's robots. I mean sure, maybe I'm just trying to justify why I like an objectively bad game, it's entirely possible. But obviously this is all just my thoughts, and I won't even argue with you if you intensely despise everything about this game. It really doesn't affect me. I'm not Bungie. I don't give a fuck! But getting into the nitty gritty. First, the gunplay. It's great. The combat was honestly one of the only things that kept me around the first game, and actually kept me coming back. That and the sweet ass armour designs. Speaking of which, as a Titan, players being given the choice between Titan, Hunter and Warlock classes, I was really looking forward to it and for a long time left disappointed by the variety in armour designs. For almost the entire game, until reaching the pretty easily attained max level of 20, I was getting nothing but the same one or maybe two variations of helmet, chest piece, shoulder guards. Now they do eventually start to get interesting, but it took a damn while and I was beginning to worry. Especially with the shadow of the Eververse microtransaction store looming overhead. That said, thanks for fucking up shaders guys! 
The collectible interchangeable shaders from the first game are now one use, one item at a time paint jobs and you need to acquire like any other loot. So now I gotta decide if I want to use up my shiny rare shaders for this equipment or hold off in case I find more powerful armour that I want painted instead down the road. And what if I only have three of this shader that I like? Which piece of my four item armour do I leave mismatched? It's just… nah. I have more nitpicks but we'd be here forever going over them all. Skill progression is pointless, earning points you'll almost never spend, the script is bloody awful at times. Meanwhile, your own character remains awkwardly stuck as a silent protagonist that they… well they aren't because they've bloody talked before I swear I've heard them. I mean, good on Bungie for creating a character with crippling anxiety, that's the only explanation I have because I know they aren't mute. See? Voice actors! More voice actors than lines. Have you got that? Say you've got it! Say something! But for every awkward line, Destiny 2 at least delivers SOMETHING in terms of character interaction or story its predecessor failed to, or at least only began to achieve in the pretty enjoyable Taken King DLC. Speaking of which, actually I went back to finish that DLC before Destiny 2 even came out, knowing character data was supposed to be transferred over. And yet despite beating Oryx and killing hundreds of Taken, my character is apparently totally unfamiliar with what they are. What were those things? Is this a bug or did I just miss something? Either way, Destiny still has its fill of technical issues, from enemies instantly transmitting to being stuck underground. Or a particularly annoying bug involving loot boxes failing to generate rewards. Repeatedly. To critique Destiny 2 would be to critique the original Destiny formula. It's not for everyone. Not quite MMO, not quite RPG, not quite story driven shooter. The sequel doesn't change much from this, which in itself might be a well deserved source of derision. But for me, the central fatal flaw to an otherwise enjoyable experience in Destiny was rectified with a perfectly passable, even if not extraordinary story mode in Destiny 2. Maybe the correct reaction should be too little too late, but for me it's a welcome improvement, making Destiny 2 a welcome, if contentious addition to my top games of 2017. Number 7. Wolfstone 3D is without a doubt one of the most technically impressive games of our generation, complete with a compelling story, top notch soundtrack, award worthy voice acting and gunplay that puts anything by Bungie to shame. Unfortunately it was released in 1961 in an alternate timeline, so I guess it doesn't actually qualify for this list. Uh, fine, I guess I'll settle for my second choice. Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus I'll come clean right off the bat, not completed this yet. I know, shame on me, but last quarter 2017 was busy. Not just for game releases, but just in general. Regardless, this sequel to 2014's The New Order has a lot going for it, as a traditional, incredibly enjoyable and surprisingly challenging first person shooter. For those who didn't play the first game, New Colossus begins with a handy dandy previously on intro scene, even allowing you to determine which of the two characters you saved in the first game, carrying that choice over into this one. But I'm happy to report I did go back and complete the new order before this game's release, so I literally stepped off one game into the other. Set after an alternate history World War II, with the defeat of the Allies by an unnaturally advanced Nazi war machine in 1946, BJ Blazkowicz and the ragtag team of freedom fighters in 1960's Diesel Punk Berlin successfully take down the mastermind behind Nazi technological supremacy, Death Set. The new order ends with a dying Blaskovitz watching his friends and loved ones escape the base before calling in a nuclear artillery strike on his location, which is exactly the moment where this game picks up, with your friends and loved ones last seen leaving on a helicopter now all around you. Huh. So I guess they cancelled the nuke, turned around, landed the helicopter, climbed this Nazi infested fortress, in the case of Fergus, last heard on the radio manning the nuclear bloody armed submarine, parked the giant ass sub to come join the gang, all just to rescue Blaskovitz. Right, sure, I mean I suppose we have to do something to explain the survival for the sequel, but I don't know, given his record I probably would have believed tanked an atomic blast as much as this obvious series of retcons, but nitpicks. Moving from Europe to the United States, we get a great dystopian take on a Nazi occupied but still very 60s feeling USA, but as a fan of alternate history fiction, 
Fatherland, Man in the High Castle, other books where it's always about the Nazis ruling the world in the 60s. This whole setting is great. Our new primary antagonist, returning from the first game, Frau Engel, is sadistically awesome. At the same time though, I can't help wonder if she's a little too much on the psychopath evil because evil laugh and kill people side of villainy. I mean, Death's Head was a monster, but he was the cold, unfeeling, mad scientist type, who'd happily dissect people or put brains into robots, but also gave off that gentlemanly persona and a disturbing glee with his fucked up work. Engel, meanwhile, is a bit more laughs manically while throwing an axe around. Combat is fast paced, awesome, violent, and sufficiently varied. The very first combat sequence consigning you to a wheelchair, which was interesting. It's good, over the top combat, and the violence is sadistically played for humour. But my enjoyment of it was challenged by a few things, which upon discussion with other people, I don't seem to be the only one thinking this. Having just finished New Order on Bring It On difficulty, I started Colossus on this same setting, but found it painfully easy to get killed. What didn't help was really poor on-screen feedback, making me oblivious to how severely injured I was practically at all times. Again and again I was dropping dead to my surprise, with me at last check having plenty of health and armour. You expect a red bloodied screen or a bit of blurring at low health in these types of games, but I did a little experiment and here at 10 health, there are no other visual indications that I am a trip on a rock from death. There are a few little control nags here and there, like getting stuck on the environment, throwing rather than stabbing during an attempted melee hit, and of course, manically spamming the pickup button while looking at the floor to try and get all the health and ammo can get a little tiresome. At times, the map design can feel non-intuitive, with me really struggling to find my way, and that's not something I usually have a problem with. If anything, I'm the navigator in any online gaming. Just ask Sam, he can attest to this. But on a similar note, there were fights in which I just couldn't figure out the logic of where enemies are coming from, just getting swamped and, as I've already mentioned, very quickly killed before I can make any sense of my surroundings. Or even worse, before I can find that bastard officer somewhere in the area who, as long as he lives, will keep spawning reinforcements. Fuck those guys! Aha, uh -huh, bestätigt, General. Und, uh, wie viele Männer für Terror Billy bei seinem Angriff an? Meine Güte, sind die bescheuert, oder was? Er führt niemanden an, er ist allein! Aber ein einziger Mann, General, unsere Sicherheit. Sie sind zuständig für die Sicherheit, die verdammte Schwachkopf! Ja! That's all I really have on this game just now. From the impression I've gotten and things I've heard, there's a bit of a more of the same quality to it. But in a world of pretty mediocre first person shooters, these games are definitely still something to be appreciated. Oh, and as for the controversy this game caused, because, you know, killing Nazis in a video game is apparently such a hot button topic that's totally never been done before, all I have to say on that is number 6. And also Nazis suck. Crash Bandicoot The Insane Trilogy Wait a second, a video game remake? In a top 10 list? What is the meaning of this? Remakes and remasters, they're really different things whose definitions tend to get a bit muddled depending on who you're talking to. Yes, I've talked shit about remasters before, dubbing 2014 the year of the remaster during our end of year video then, and mocking on several occasions the re-re-re-re-releases -re of Skyrim with occasionally mildly improved textures or something. But when it comes to remakes, I don't have an issue. So long as it's faithful to the original, which doesn't mean it has to be a shot for shot remake a la Oddworld Newton Tasty. Again, what's with the ns in these things? But hopefully gives something new to the table as well, a la Resident Evil HD with its additions to combat, enemy types and more. Still holding out for that Dino Crisis remake, Kawata. You said you were interested. Get on it! But anyway, where does this long demanded revisit to Crash Bandicoot sit in all this? Well, it's Crash fucking Mandicoot. Modern graphics aside, this is just a near perfect recreation of those classic PS1 games, and honestly, I'm okay with that. From the recreated soundtrack to the ball aching difficulty, everything's here. And I'm gonna just start complaining now, but this is for catharsis, not to deride the game, which really is working exactly as designed. Fucking hell, this game can burn in a pit of fire! It took me so long to get through the first of the three games here. It was agonizing. There are sequences in this game that barely make sense, timing challenges and jumps that barely seem possible, and a punishing checkpoint system. Now with that said, the second and third games are a bit more relaxing, but to hell with that demon that is the first game! 
All I'll say is, Road to Nowhere. Oh my god, the road to nowhere. This level killed me. It, 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 it killed me. In every sense. 50 plus lives I'd built up over the course of the game till now, and every single one of them dropped on this masochist's wet dream. There is an irony in this mission, however. Without a doubt, my worst experience in this game also turned out to be one of the most hilarious. There was a glitch in the original where you could essentially bypass the entire torture by jumping onto rope and walking to the end. So, what did they do in this near-perfect recreation of the original game? Yep, they kept the glitch. I wasn't recording my own audio at this moment, but I can tell you, there was laughter the entire time. Manic, painful laughter, and all that time I wasted trying to do it legitimately. Now, aside from bitching at my own incompetence at this admittedly hard game, really should have taken that title literally before purchase, mm, apostrophe sane indeed, there are genuine issues I have with it. Crash, or Coco, since you actually have the option to switch between characters, has what I can only assume to be a rounded hitbox. There are times where a successful land on the edge of a platform will still inexplicably see you fall to your death. There's also an inherent problem with this 2D style platforming in a 3D environment. Mario can only move in two dimensions, or across the multiverse if you're talking about Super Mario Odyssey, so you only have to worry about your X and Y axes. If you've jumped above a platform, you're going to land on it. In Crash's 3D environment, a similar kind of jump can see you miss a platform entirely because of that pesky little Z axis. Whatever, there's a lot to love about this game, from the variety and visuals of these worlds, to the interesting level types, to honestly, as much as I might complain, the challenge of the game itself. So long as you know what you're getting into, I'd happily recommend this game to anyone nostalgic for the classics or not. And if you're a sadistic motherfucker, challenge a friend to finishing Road to Nowhere. Don't worry, Danny. It's easy. It's a game for children, after all. <laughs> Prick. I just realised I didn't even begin to talk about the story. Oh. Um. The Eastern Bard Bandicoot is a small rabbit-sized nocturnal marsupial native to southeastern Australia and is one of three extant bandicoot species in the genus Paramelis of the family Paramelis. Number 5 Why didn't you tell me? You told me that the developers listened to our feedback. The developers? Listen to the complaints of Battlefront 1? They included Clone Wars content and added single player. But they also listened to their publisher. So what I told you was true, from a certain point of view. A certain point of view? Oh, can your tits look the DLC's free? Oh yeah, we find ourselves here once again, don't we? You were showing so much promise with Battlefront 2, but you just had to dip your hand in the cookie jar one more time. There's zero point me wasting this review going over the loot box issue since it's been done to death already. All I will say is, it's a damn shame because while still far from perfect, this controversy aside, Battlefront 2 was a good game. DICE seemed to take the criticisms of the 2015 game to heart, giving at least something in each of the overlooked areas. Space combat, class gameplay, other eras, all of which I'll cover soon enough, but I just wanted to start with the biggest addition, the single player campaign. Generally speaking, I'm an offline player. I like my RPGs, my storylines, my ability to pause. Online is fun, but it's rarely as memorable and tends, with some exceptions, to have a short lifespan. So, adding a campaign earns immediate points by me. Or, since they should have had one to begin with, they, they don't lose points? Either way, I'll just say now, I liked it, and screw it if that's the minority opinion. While it can't compare to a focused single player experience like Wolfenstein, I can say that it's a fuck ton more fun and for the love of god way more memorable than any of the recent Battlefield campaigns. Following Imperial Special Forces Commander Iron Versio, the game opens right before the Battle of Endor and spans the year-long collapse of the Empire, leading to the decisive conflict between Empire and New Republic on Jakku. 
As a Star Wars fan, I loved it, but and I really can't say anything else without bringing it up, so skibbity skip if you don't want spoilers. Yeah, you join the Rebels. I can understand people being disappointed by this, I was, but I can't take points off for not having the story go the way I personally wanted. If that were the case, I hate Game of Thrones by now for killing off everyone I like. I will say there are scenes in the trailers that are oddly missing in game, Rogue One style, but whether they were just cut naturally or deliberate attempts to mislead, I can't say. Either way, accusing DICE of lying is a bit much. Misdirection to throw us off the direction of the plot, sure. Other characters in this universe show up for missions and space combat as a regular feature, so prepare to be expected to fly a lot. Not a problem for me, like, these are actually some of my favourite moments in the game and I've actually gone back to replay some of them. The characters, both new and from the films, were all well done, with some great voice acting and a welcome bit of humour injected in there too. If I die here, I'm glad you will too. Well, thank you, buddy. Hell, I'll even defend that oh-so-boring hand mission. As someone who's spent many, many hours wandering the Citadel listening to random people's conversations, I appreciated the little bit of world building and the breather in the action. Plus, it did involve the one character who would actually suit this kind of setting. Besides, if nothing else, I got to do this. Aiden's character trajectory was another thing I'd seen bashed, but I'd say it was handled perfectly fine. I mean, for fuck's sake, it made no less sense than Finn's storyline in The Force Awakens. But people love that movie. I don't know. Looking back on all this, it's almost like people will always be excessively and unreasonably critical of something as long as there's a bandwagon rolling on it. Now, that's not to say there aren't issues, but there's not much else that can't be explained, even if not excused, with simply they were always thinking multiplayer first. It's not an overly long campaign, at only six to seven hours at my count, but it didn't feel too short for the story it wanted to tell. Even so, to my surprise, it actually continues with the latest free expansion pack. So, awesome. Actual bonus points this time. But, moving finally on to the multiplayer, where there is more good stuff, and plenty of bad. I fucking love that there's Clone Wars content again, and it feels like it's being fairly represented rather than a minimal effort tag on. Little things like bringing back the voice actors from the animated series, locations like Ryloth and units like the Hyena Bomber and the squid drill things. I did ask them in 2015 to have a bit more imagination, and now the Rebels have walkers, so good job. The sequels have a presence too, and while a little bit better to start with, that first expansion pack has helped tip the scales with a pretty fun map on Crate. Wait a second. Crate? Loot crates? Oh my god. Sadly, there are only three or four Galactic Assault maps per era right now. Now, my instinct might be to cry, where the fuck's Bespin? Where the fuck's Geonosis? But looking back on DICE's Battlefield series, they've never really released with more than nine maps. And the work that goes into each is astonishing. Here we had 11 maps, and Loot Crate made 12 just a month after release. Unfortunately, it misses majorly by lacking cross-era maps. Clones in Mos Eisley, 8080s on Naboo, you know it's possible, and it's what the fans want. Whatever. At least we got Camino. That's all that matters. The return of classes is a big improvement. Who'd have thought? With Assault, Heavy, Officer and Specialist, as well as Advanced Faction Unique Units. Class progression and unlocks are, thank fuck, tied to use of those classes, rather than that bullshit system in the beta. Oh, get scrap from loot boxes to craft new weapons! Eh! I mean, I rarely snipe in online games, but for the sake of getting that bastard rifle everyone else has, I give it a go. And now it's possibly my favourite class to use. Well, except for my spicy boy. However, hero characters. Can you fuck off, please? Yavin 4, Rebels. We need to defend this small room. Over the intercom, what do I hear? Darth Vader has joined the battle. Darth Maul has joined the battle. Emperor Palpatine has joined the battle. Darth Maul has joined. Kylo Ren has joined. Darth Vader. Yeah, this is fun, guys. This is fun to deal with. Look how much fun we're having. I hated this in the last game. I still hate it. Adding demigods into an infantry simulator just doesn't work, and at this point, I don't know if it will ever feel right. 
All I can suggest is maybe drastically reducing hero health but improving its regen, giving them decent survivability still, while punishing stupid and frankly unfair moves like running into a hallway full of enemies, which at present is only a minor obstacle to a Darth Maul. But really, can we just have servers without heroes? I actually don't give that much of a shit about playing as Bosk. I can live without it. I have more nitpicks. Stop getting stuck on the environment constantly, bloody hell lag, and getting trapped behind enemy lines because stupid map design and doors that only open for one side leaving you to die. Also, single player arcade mode against bots. Excited that they included it? Incredibly disappointed with how bare bones it is. Anyway, with two and a half pages of script read and only one thing left in my notes, I'll just leave you with the bugs. Number 4. Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice is an interesting game that I don't actually have too much to say about. Thank fuck. I want to describe its more cinematic experience, but not in the way that, say, Destiny was described as cinematic because it had cutscenes. No, what Hellblade is, is an incredibly well presented experience. And I don't just mean graphically, which I'll say now were hugely impressive, and continues to cement my why even point out the graphics anymore philosophy since every second game now looks near photorealistic. But the narrative structure, complete with running narration, the total absence of any on-screen displays, the incredibly foreboding atmosphere, and the unique audio all just drags you into it. Following Senua, an Arcadian girl on a quest through Norse Hell to recover the soul of her lover, it combines puzzle gameplay with the to-be-expected slasher combat which, while really awesome, is not really at the forefront here. When you do get into a fight though, it isn't something you can just walk through like a demigod on your way to the next boss. Each encounter is a real life and death situation, requiring thought and timing. Or just kicking a motherfucker off a bridge. I gotta say, I really like this style of combat. Much more than just rush in and beat shit into submission. While this style of combat is involving, especially with the absence of a health bar or really any other distractions on screen, it's not overly difficult. Really the only time I found myself taking excessive damage and dying once was against Birdman and his bitch to dodge attacks. But even so, combat still feels like a challenge. Honestly, you could probably count the total number of enemies in this game if you just had an extra couple pair of hands, but each and every kill is earned and feels rewarding. Travelling deeper into this world, offing bosses, passing challenges and unlocking the way to Helheim and Hell herself, the game implements an effective motivational tactic. Each time you die, a curse in the form of rot on your arm will spread gradually to your head until you are eventually lost forever, i.e. your game data gets erased. Wow, thanks, I really needed the extra reason to avoid giant axe dude. There is reason to believe this may actually just be a bluff by the devs to add tension, but honestly if it is? I don't want to know. It was, after all, a good motivator to think cautiously in combat, time attack strike, not let myself get flanked, keep the illusion going. Something particularly showcased in the advertisement of this game was its attempt to simulate the effects of psychosis, which in Senua's case involves hearing voices in her head, which is exactly why, and I stress this, play with earphones. The experience is… strange. It's perhaps appropriately uncomfortable, but from a gameplay perspective, you kinda get used to it and having a voice scream at you to dodge as an unseen enemy swings at you from behind is handy. Thanks, voice in my head. Not sure how true to life that is, but eh. The game itself was released on a pretty inspiring philosophy by an independent developer. To produce a smaller game, but at AAA quality, sold at half the price tag expected from a modern game. And while it lacks the open world 300 times the size of Belgium and all the fetch quests that go along with it, but honestly, I can live without that if it means more solid, focused games like this and less of a hit to my already abused bank balance. I'm not sure of its replay value, but just as how some films only need to be seen once, I'd put Hellblade in a similar category. If you're interested in Viking mythology, dark game stories or just slasher games generally, though don't expect it heavy on the action, I suggest giving this one some of your time. Number 3. Prey 
is the not reboot, not sequel, not remake of a 2006 game of the same name, and the latest example of Bethesda buying up a previously existing property. But where last year saw the lightning paced Corridor Blaster Doom reboot, which was my number 4 game of 2016, Prey is a quieter, cautiously paced, much more confined survival shooter. And a really fucking good one. Based in a secret scientific research facility which has become infested with killer interdimensional alien organisms. Ha, ah, this kind of sounds familiar. Good morning, Gordon. You play as a hazmat suit wearing, tool swinging member of the science team, Morgan. Good morning, Gordon. The player determined male or female, Dr. Morgan Yu, wakes up in their apartment ready for their first day at work. And again, I could make further comparisons to this relaxed and deceptively mundane opening being a lot like Half Life's. But in the course of events, Morgan is stranded aboard Talos 1, a research space station owned by the corporation, finding it in the midst of an outbreak of creatures known as the Typhon. Mixing up the aforementioned theme and setting of Half-Life, style and gameplay of Bioshock, with a sprinkling of Alien Isolation and Gmod Prop Hunt, you have a single core objective of figuring out how to fix this situation. But how exactly you go about that? is left surprisingly open, or at the very least, the game makes a very good job of giving the illusion of openness. First thing though I really need to say on Prey is… what the fuck happened? No, I'm not about to start shitting on the game itself, as I've already said, I think it's fantastic, but prior to buying it myself I seem to see nothing but negative rep on it. Low frame rate on PS4, broken combat system, even after release it was showing up with mediocre ratings and an almost immediate price drop in stores. But you know what, all this has just taught me three things. Internet comments are shit. Internet reviews are shit. At least the ones written in the internet comment sections, which really just makes us an extension of the first point. And internet... F fuck it, the game's good. The non-linear survival aspects of Prey are what shine out for me the most, with an organic sense of choice throughout the game, constant feeling of vulnerability, and the variety of ways to approach problems makes this a great survival situation simulation. Try saying that five times with an alien crab eating your face. Your first instinct is to obviously get off the station. In a game like Half-Life, this objective is always out of reach though, because you need to go through the very linear pathway set out for you. But let's say I use the glue cannon to build a makeshift staircase up a cliffside, breaking into your brother Alex's office, he being the company president and somewhat overweight individual, and ultimately gaining access to his personal escape pod. As far as I'm aware, I could have ended the game right here and then. But rightly so, my AI partner and acting conscious reminds me not to be a dick and first find a way of stopping the Typhon from potentially spreading to Earth. There are many moments throughout the game like this you may come across, a lot of them blurring the lines between the traditional main story and side quest format we've become so used to. There isn't a single set way of playing the game. You can choose to, like me, save as many of the survivors on board Talos 1 as you can. The fact that each and every member of the crew has a name and a face makes us feel so much more important, and throughout exploring the station you'll come across little slices of life from them, from love letters between staff to their D&D character sheets. The flip side of this though is that you can kill any NPC, no matter how seemingly important they are to your mission. Balancing the line between human and Typhon as you pump these uncomfortable looking neuromods into your eyeball is another consideration you'll have to make. I for one never stray too far into the crazy alien abilities I know are available to you, being rightly paranoid about losing my humanity and being a danger to Earth even if I do get back. But more importantly, if you pass a certain threshold, the automated turrets in the station will start identifying you as an alien rather than human and make your life a bit more awkward. Yeah, I couldn't have that, I grew way too attached to my turret family. Regarding combat and the Typhon themselves, like I said earlier, prop hunt. Having aliens able to disguise themselves as any object in the game makes for interesting environmental interactions. I almost felt bad later on when I acquired an upgrade to my goggle headset things let me spot mimics automatically, but that wasn't until late enough into the game so it didn't ruin the experience and by then I was facing much more deadly variations of the Typhon. Now I can't say I have that much love for some of these enemy types, a lot of the time they were more of a nuisance than anything else, like oh for fuck's sake another one of these electric phantoms, gotta waste rounds killing it from range then don't I, prick. And zero-g combat against some of these fuckers is a pain in the ass, from kamikaze boys to the absolute bane of my existence with these psychic blasting bastards. I I'm already in barely controllable zero-g, I don't need you blarting me around on top of that! 
So while playing as a straightforward shooter might piss you off some, it makes up for it by providing alternatives which, to be frank, are always going to be more fun. Whether disguising yourself as toilet roll to sneak past enemies, collecting a gaggle of turrets to deal with all the problems for you, or incapacitating enemies with a glue cannon. There's a myriad of creative ways to deal with problems, which really makes reviews like these baffling to me. I mean, what do you want? I suppose we could scrap the taser, the nerf crossbow, the glue cannon, the grenades that convert enemies and objects to their base materials to be recycled and turned into more ammo, and all the psychic and shape-changing abilities, and replace them with more types of gun. What with you can shoot at stuff with. That nice and original for you now! I won't give anything away, but for that ending, I was for the length of the credits rolling worried that I had just played the most anticlimactic game in history. But a post credit scene made up for it, and honestly, I think I'm okay with it. I could see it pissing some people off, but though I can't say I called it, I knew there was something more going on. The hints and references were too random to have just been put in there for no reason. It's a bit of a mindfuck, and while it doesn't bother me as a twist, I can see it harming the replayability. Still, the exploration of this deserted station, experimentation with abilities and alternate ways of playing, and just the enjoyability of the game itself, makes Prey a well-deserved top game of 2017. Number 2 Activating short range attack gear. Alert. Large enemy group detected. Yes, I'm aware of that. Near Automata. Playing this one was an example of my ongoing attempt to expand the sort of games and genres of games I'm willing to play. No doubt I wouldn't have touched this even only a couple of years ago. An overly Japanese hack and slash with giant sword wielding girls and skimpy goth outfits, but for whatever reason, probably the girls and skimpy goth outfits to be honest, I gave it a go. And to put it bluntly, fucking hell am I glad I did. Not only was this seriously contending for my game of the year, but the whole gaming experience is one that's going to stick with me. There is a lot to talk about with Automata, but at its core, it's a game about humanity and what that means. Ironic, given the total absence of humans from its cast. Written and directed by Yoka Taro, Automata is a difficult game to describe. Starting out as a thought-provoking, robot-hacking doddle, just when you think it's going to leave you feeling hopeful for the future, it punches you in the gut, makes you doubt the purpose of life, and then the credits try to murder you. Dealing with concepts of consciousness, free will and self-determination, nihilism, depression and perpetual warfare, its many Nietzschean philosophical musings can seem a little on the nose at times. Uh, look, the main character's called 2B! Like, 2B or not to Shakespeare! I still found it a fascinating, by its own admission, weird game, even if it required a second playthrough for me to fully appreciate it. But that was kinda by design, so we'll get to that. Set in a post-apocalyptic far future, a few thousand years into an ongoing war between machines created by alien invaders and androids created by humanity, you play as 2B, 9S and later A2, three androids of Yorha, the military spearhead of the resistance. You're dropped straight into this ongoing war against the machine life forms, but this really shouldn't be a spoiler considering the evil machines are adorable little rust buckets, while your side is, well. The world isn't quite as black and white as it initially seems, even though it is sometimes literally black and white. Yeah, again, little on the nose with the symbolism sometimes. They're wearing blindfolds because they can't be saying the truth, son! Initially, mindless machines begin showing more and more signs of consciousness to the point where for better or worse, they begin imitating elements of humanity, and in some cases, even more so than the androids, who are actually made in man's image. So, expectedly weird story, but how's the game itself? The gameplay variety was one of the first positive things I picked up on. While a hack and slash for the most part, coupled with shooter mechanics, there's scrolling flight segments, hacking minigames, and even the relatively straightforward melee combat is mixed up with side-scrolling, top-down mob brawls, as well as plenty of massive robot boss battles. And because of all this, I really enjoyed the gameplay itself. Combat presents a decent challenge, without being too off-putting for those of us who, you know, suck at Dark Souls. 
Come to think of it, aside from the occasional moment of stupidity or agreeing to eat that damn fish, I only died once in combat during my first playthrough, incidentally at the very end of the introductory mission, forcing me to play from the beginning since saving is disabled until you complete the first mission. Now this would have bothered me more, but A, the combat was still fun a second time through, and B, the soundtrack for this level was amazing, and I'm pleased to say that standard is maintained. I've said before I love soundtracks. Games, movies, but even saying that, the time it took for me to fall in love with this score might be a personal record. It's my favourite of the year, hands down. The vocals, the sound design, how quieter or more dynamic versions of a track play depending on the situation. There's even 8-bit versions for hacking segments. Now I won't waste this entire review gushing over the soundtrack, but if you are interested, Alien Manifestation, Amusement Park, Song of the Ancients, Weight of the World, and about a dozen others because I suck at picking favourites. The story is weird without a doubt, but once you've surrendered to the surrealism, it's really enjoyable. I like the characters, and the voice acting is better than I was expecting from a Japanese to English game. Now I do have a couple issues with this game though. My impression of the game's open world was jarring, being kind of unexpected after that introductory, much more linear factory battle. And having just played another open world post-apocalyptic third person action RPG featuring a female protagonist in a world overrun by machines, the overgrown city here felt by comparison like a massive downgrade. The kind of bland and empty map made it feel like I was playing a port of the game for a last-gen console, and the repetitiveness of this world was worsened by the necessary repeated playthroughs in the same environments. The variety in regions helps, even if questionable in their logic, with desert, forest, a friggin' castle, and a pretty terrifying if endearing theme park, all within walking distance of the city centre. Bit of an aside, but third totally lifeless open world desert I played in 2017. Well, fourth, there was two in Mass Effect. Finally though, I need to go back to talk about how this game is structured. As mentioned, it requires multiple playthroughs to get the full experience and every ending. As a standalone game, playing through 2B story from beginning to end credits was good, but as the credits ran I felt the game had just been a bit too short for me to fully connect with the characters, and that ending didn't have the huge emotional impact on me that I feel it was trying. There were a lot of unfinished plot threads, unresolved conflicts, disappearing characters, but after the credits, you are encouraged to play the game again, where you are treated to Route B, playing the same series of events but from the perspective of 9S. While rehashy in many places, Route B does fill in most of the gaps and drops a couple of major bombshells that really changed my impression of the game on the whole for the better. But even then, completing this is still far from the end of the game, with only now an entire second half becoming unlocked, carrying on beyond the first set of credits and introducing our third character, A2. Now this convoluted storytelling is definitely risky and a little off-putting, but it's oddly fitting in a game that in every aspect keeps the players on their toes, as it constantly defies expectations and convention. Loading screens that aren't actually loading screens, endings that aren't endings, the ability to end the game by removing your own operating system in the customization window, and even the game's final final battle being against the end credits. Not a joke or an easter egg or anything, it's actually the only legitimate way to get the good ending. Basically, Yokotaro, you're a fucking madman and you have a new fan. Nier Automata is certainly a strange game, but from what I've read in interviews and played, it was made by people, as insane as they might be, who love games, and whether groundbreaking philosophical storytelling or just fun insanity, have at least chosen to try something new. Nier Automata is easily one of the best games of 2017, managing to leave me with that empty, what the fuck now feeling that only certain games can, and that only listening to its soundtrack on loop for weeks afterwards could remedy. It'll never be for everyone's tastes, but in my opinion, Nier Automata is easily one of the greatest. Well, if you've been following my uploads for the year, my number one might not be that much of a surprise, especially since I pretty much called it back in April, not to mention just referenced it a few minutes ago. So yeah, that other open world post-apocalyptic third person action RPG featuring a female protagonist in a world overrun by machines, Horizon Zero Dawn. Just this game. What the hell more can I really say? I already did a standalone review of it, the first and currently only time I've done so for a game on this channel, and talked about it at length there. I just fell in love with this game. Set in what's rightly described as a post-post-apocalyptic world, some thousand years after the collapse of modern civilization, it follows the story of Aloy, a tribal, outcast from birth, on a quest to simply uncover where she came from, who her mother was and why she was outcast. 
Only in the process of following this very empathetic human story does the wider scale and larger mystery of this world unfold. And the world itself was something I was eager to find out more about, not being something I can say I've really seen before. A combination of low-tech tribes and fledgling kingdoms common to a fantasy or historical RPG with high-concept science fiction and robot dinosaurs. I didn't quite hit this in my review, but it's just come to me now that Zero Dawn, it's not a shit name by the way, probably just came to me at the right time. 2016 going on 2017, honestly, I was pretty tired of games. Sure, I can pick up New Vegas or Skyrim really any day, but picking up and getting into a new game? Trying to become invested in the story, all while feeling obligated to do every tedious side quest, was just becoming a chore for me. In all honesty, based on the first few clips of gameplay of Horizon Zero Dawn, and given my mindset at that point, I don't know if I'd have even bothered with this game, and quite probably the only reason I did was because of my high opinion of the developers. Basically, if this was a Ubisoft title, I'd have passed. Zero Dawn though managed to rejuvenate me with a game I could hardly shut off till I was done with a new world I could fully invest myself in and ultimately became the best start to an all around brilliant year I could have had. Since I covered most of this game already in my review, and I really need to talk less, I'll only briefly discuss major points. Firstly, and I forgot to cover this in my previous review, Thank Fuck composer Joris Deman returns to score a Guerrilla Games project. After doing the first three Killzone games but being sadly absent from Shadowfall, I loved his past work and here it's just as good if not better the main theme in particular. The gameplay is great if at its core admittedly not totally original. We've seen similar before, mixing stealth and platforming with this bow and melee combat. Tomb Raider, Shadow of Mordor, those games come to mind. What sets it apart is the enemies, the variety, the different tactics you can employ, whether traps, identifying weak points to chip at, or simply using the environment. And then there's the sheer scale of the machines, the realism of the animations, and just how unironically animal-like these machines are, it's a joy to me. Another thing is, the Frozen Wilds expansion pack. What an example of good DLC, an actual expansion pack. A new region and storyline, with a few new enemy types, some new weapons and outfits, new characters, and perhaps best of all, it wasn't something held back for an at-release season pass. One of those little bastard leaflets inside the game case. Yeah, you know the ones I mean. Replaying Horizon for the DLC and for this video also just made me remember how fucking stunning it is. With the other side of gameplay here being exploration and the more RPG side of things, the open world itself has to impress and yep, it does. Now, graphics are a funny thing. We really do tend to overhype them as the be all and end all of games. Oh, look how good, insert any dice game here, looks, oh, can't wait for that overpriced derivative shit. I don't know. When in reality, after initial impressions, we really stop paying attention to the graphics. But of all the photorealistic games this year, Horizon is the one that keeps impressing me. Every five or ten minutes, I'm having to stop just to soak in this snow-capped mountain range or sun-baked desert. It's really the same feeling I had playing Skyrim for the first time back in 2011. On that note though, I feel it bears mentioning the in-game screenshot tool. This is a brilliant addition that I totally forgot to cover in my review, letting you pause, edit lighting, camera angle, filters, poses, and since playing the DLC I've been putting this to a lot of use. PS4 background fodder. I can't think what more to say about this game. Or, or more accurately, I can't decide which things from the list of things I want to say about this game I actually have time to. I'll repeat the biggest issue I had from my review. The final mission fell a bit meh. For all the build-up and dread, it came down to a bigger than normal fight against the same enemies we've already faced. I mean, on one level I'm glad I didn't have to fight what I thought the game was building up to. That would have been terrifying, but that also would have been fucking awesome, and a lot more interesting. Really that was my biggest gripe, but that aside, engaging combat and interesting enemy types, top-notch voice acting, facial and body animations, a beautiful in-game world. Well written and likeable characters, great world building and in game lore, and a heart wrenching but captivating story. It was a pretty easy decision in the end what my top game of the year was going to be. Horizon Zero Dawn. That name is still ridiculous. Well, that's the countdown. Thank you very much for watching, everybody. I do enjoy doing these videos every year. They're one of my biggest projects. I officially started the work on this back in August. 2017, so that kind of gives you an idea of how long production goes on this, but the whole year I'm always looking out for games, 
I'm always looking out for footage to get and what to say. And, you know, I just like the sound of my own voice, I guess. Because these are always far too long and far too fucking stressful. <laughs> so, I'll be glad to see the end of it. But, work on top games of 2018 coming soon. Alright, see you all there. Bye. I'm done. Dinosaurs. Uh -huh.